All right, and thank you, uh, Sophie, for the introduction. So I'm Carolyn Lundquist, and I'll be leading off this series of webinars. So hopefully everyone attends the whole series over the next few weeks. And this one is on one of the Sustainable Seas documents that we prepared that came out a few weeks ago on marine spatial planning. Are you going to get there? Um, and uh, just to make sure everyone is aware, all of these tools and resources are available online on the Sustainable Seas uh, website. So if you look under Tools and Resource and under Guidance uh, Summary, I've also got the web link um, under there. And I'm pretty sure uh, Sophie will probably send it to everyone after the webinar series so that you can access the, the two documents that we've prepared on marine spatial planning. So we thought we'd just start out with what actually is marine spatial planning? And while there are um, lots and lots of definitions that have been used all over the world, uh, the key elements that come out of marine spatial planning are that they're processes that use data and knowledge to assess the diversity of overlapping uses of the marine environment and how these uses in combination affect that whole diversity of the social, cultural, economic, and environmental values that uh, we as humans have for the marine environment. And so basically, marine spatial planning is something that can be used to support more effective decision making. Uh, so here I've really described marine spatial planning as a process. So it's not actually a specific tool. There are lots of different tools that we can use to support marine spatial planning. But really, it's about the fact that you're thinking more holistically and bringing all of the different elements that are going on in the marine environment into consideration and typically using a participatory process where the different stakeholders and interest groups, uh, Iwi and Hapu, all have a seat at the table. So typically, when we talk about marine spatial planning, we think the way that a lot of us do think about the marine environment, where we use might use maps. So we often think of where we do things, particularly economic interests, but also a lot of our biodiversity values, we might see where we have something. Um, and so MSP often is associated with that use of maps and spatial planning, so the allocation of use. Now, marine spatial planning has been used globally and nationally, uh, and including regional and local scale processes here in New Zealand. Um, many of you will have probably heard of Taitimu Taipari, the Haraki Gulf Marine Spatial Plan is one of our um, more renowned marine spatial planning processes, but there are also a lot of other processes that would also qualify as marine spatial planning that have gone on in New Zealand, whether they were looking at single types of uh, processes or allocating, for example, marine reserves, but bringing into um, that marine reserve planning process, all of the other uses that are going on in the marine environment as examples. And But historically, MSP does have the perception that it's about spatial allocation of economic development. And that's really how a lot of the marine spatial planning started, um, much of it in Europe, on looking at where the best place is to have mining or offshore wind or other things while considering a number of complementary or conflicting uses. So why do we need marine spatial planning? So I think in, in the document, we reviewed a number of the challenges that we have in the marine environment. And a lot of these are also reviewed in the other documents, uh, these other summary documents. So there's one on the fragmented legislative regimes and often our single sector management and legislation that is historically how we do marine management in New Zealand. But there's also a challenge with many people thinking marine spatial planning actually requires requires substantial data and technical capacity to be implemented. But a lot of marine spatial planning can actually go without, uh, can rely on expert knowledge. So we can use simpler tools. We don't need to be doing the full whiz-bang models um, and fancy technical tools and methods to inform marine spatial planning. Often we'll know what's going on in an estuary and you can say, you know, if we don't want X to happen, you know, we know that overlaps with, uh, for example, um, a key area for shellfish or kaimawana gathering. So we can uh, quite easily use a much more simpler approach using marine spatial planning as a participatory process with the relevant stakeholders involved. Uh, now, we also have challenges with data accessibility and sharing in New Zealand. So we have a lot of data that's out there, but it's often um, you need to know it exists and know where it's located in order to be able to access it. And of course, in our oceans, our oceans are um, 
very um, complexly related to stressors that um, come from land. So for example, our sediments and nutrients that often are major impacts in the coastal zone are something that we need to consider also in marine spatial planning. So it's not just those marine uses that are part of marine spatial planning. So what are some of the benefits if we're doing marine spatial planning? So again, most of the time people will think just like with EBM, that marine spatial planning is about the environment. Well, that is one thing that is beneficial for marine spatial planning. And so here I have a whole suite of potential ecological or environmental benefits from the identification of uh, ecologically important areas. So that's something that our regional councils do. Um, we also have the ability then for marine spatial planning to having identified important biodiversity or ecological sites, they can be in, um, incorporated into decision making, but also um, helping to identify where those places where there are conflicts between economic development or human use and nature values. Um, and so they're basically a whole bunch of ecological or environmental benefits. But we also have economic benefits of marine spatial planning. And a key one here is if marine spatial planning has occurred, it will have identified where economic uses can and can't occur. And by having often a statutory process or some type of official legislated or um, implemented process, then industry or private sector will have certainty that their investments will then hold through for often 20 or 30 years, the timeline of many of these different things. Um, and so, again, with economic benefits, you can also see what things are compatible uses, um, determining what the conflicts are between different types of uses, the ability to plan for future uses. So what are emerging things that we don't yet have in New Zealand, like offshore wind, and how can we understand what things that will work and won't work with these new technologies or new uses of the marine environment? Um, and finally, there's social benefits. So again, one of those key things of marine spatial planning is it's a process. And we find a lot of particularly our newer industries um, look at this thing we call social license. So do we actually have agreement from our local communities and citizens that a particular activity is actually something we want to have in New Zealand? And MSP as a participatory process then facilitates those conversations and discussions with the community and with Iwi and Hapu on what the activity is, what its impacts might be, uh, what it is compatible with and or incompatible with, and can help to gain social license for a lot of these new industries. But marine spatial planning also allows us to have input as members of the community on the allocation of marine space. So through participation in the processes, we can actually determine what type of uses we want in the marine environment. Uh, so participation, again, is one of those key parts of marine spatial planning. And so here, one of our key recommendations that we suggested is that marine spatial planning should be our in, underpinned by participatory processes that are accessible to all relevant parties and with clear and effective communication of the objectives and management goals. And so within uh, this diagram that we've put together, Basically, we have kind of a stepwise process, and you'll notice that it's an infinity loop. So a marine spatial planning process doesn't end when a spatial planning report is put out. Um, you have to actually continue to monitor and evaluate after you implement the suggestions of a marine spatial plan. But it starts with the identification of who is the working group or the people that should be participating and will be impacted by the marine spatial planning. So who should have a seat at the table and using that group to work together to define what the goals or objectives of the marine spatial plan should be. Uh, and then we get a little bit techie where we bring in all the data but also Mataranga Maori um, and uh, um, other information to look at what different options are for the marine spatial planning, uh, develop that plan, implement the plan, and again, monitor and evaluate. But again, continuing that communication with your um, stakeholders in Iwi and Hapu throughout the process. Uh, and 
we're not the only ones putting together best practice principles. These are some from the Environment Foundation for Aotearoa New Zealand um, that we also were um, made aware of. And so these match a lot of, again, the overseas principles as well as a lot of our principles for ecosystem-based management. So key things here include Tangata Whenua, whenua user groups, conservationists, again, from the beginning, don't bring, bring people in at the end when you've already developed a marine spatial plan, develop it with um, the people who will be uh, impacted by the plan. Identify a common goal, an appropriate process for including people, uh, plan for the future, don't plan for the past. So make sure you're including these future uh, things, whether it's future climate or future industries, future opportunities. Um, focus on identifying those opportunities, both for the environment, but also for economic, social, and cultural well-being. Use multiple sources of knowledge, so science as well as Mataranga Māori to inform the process, include historical perspective. So a lot of our challenges, we remember what we see now, but we often don't know what the environments were like, for example, 100 years ago. And this is often called a sliding baseline. So making sure that we understand how much degradation has already occurred and bring what Rich will talk about shortly, that estimate, um, that element of restoration into the picture. So marine spatial planning can also be used to um, plan for restoring coastal habitats. And again, and that best practice of ensuring people are engaged all the way through the process. Now, uh, one of those things I mentioned was data and knowledge are important. And again, we have uh, one of the webinars that you'll see shortly, I believe on the 19th of June with Judy Hewitt and Justine Young. And this is about the broad knowledge base for marine management. But we have a lot of different types of information that can brought into marine spatial planning. And so another key recommendation, MSP processes should be evidence-based, but not stalled by a lack of perfect data. And we can still inform decisions with imperfect data as long as we're acknowledging those gaps and uncertainties and making our decision making precautionary. So one of the tools here that I've got on um, the slide was one of the tools that we um, created in Sustainable Seas in the Spatially Explicit Decision Support Tools. And we call this Teo Kaupo o Hina Moana. And here we actually compiled a large number of hundreds of data sets on the marine environment so that we actually have what we called a one-stop shop for looking at data on different uses, different stressors. So everything from dredging to um, consents, aquaculture consents, biodiversity layers, um, climate change predictions of ocean acidification, anything that we could find that we put all together in one place. And so that tool is available if anyone is interested as well. And also can be the links can be found on the Sustainable Seas website. Uh, and then another important thing about marine spatial planning is that it is a much more holistic picture. So we're not just managing on a single consent basis. We're looking holistically across the whole environment, all the different values and all the different stressors in the marine environment. And so again, in this picture, um, we've got that key recommendation that approaches to MSP should enable decision makers to continue and to consider and integrate multiple and cumulative stressors into spatial planning. And so again, in the um, one of the Sustainable Seas Project, we've actually developed a lot of models that help us to bring um, multiple stressors into spatial planning models, as well as to look at how stressors interact. Uh, now, marine spatial planning often gets confused with ecosystem-based management, and they're um, very much similar in terms of a lot of the principles uh, that are about them, though the marine spatial planning does involve that more allocation of space. But a lot of the same principles do uh, work for both of them. Now on the right is that picture of the ecosystem-based management principles that were put together by the challenge leadership team in the early phases of the challenge. But key things co-governance, so observing to treaty the Waitangi, supporting partnership Tikanga and Mataranga Maori, collaborative decision-making, so again, collaboration, co-designing and participatory decision-making processes, 
knowledge base, so again informed by science in Mataranga. Um, human activities are brought into that consideration of marine spatial planning, so that whole variety of uses and values that marine spatial planning should also be tailored, so place and time specific uh, should be sustainable, so looking at making sure that marine spatial planning ensures that our marine environments are safeguarded for future generations, and adaptive, so again in that little infinite loop. Um, once we make a marine spatial plan, it should continue to be monitored and the plan adapted if it's working correctly, um, enhance the things that are doing that are doing well. And if it's not working and getting the results you want, then um, use adaptive management to change the, um, the parts of the plan to try and get a better outcome. So marine spatial planning quite often is used to support economic development by determining where new industries are best able to be placed. Um, and so here we just have another diagram of some of um, some possible industries, uh, many of which already exist in New Zealand. But the key thing is that marine spatial planning can improve that understanding of overlaps between economic development and existing activities and values. It can also look at considering the additional stressors and those stressor interactions resulting from new activities. But one other important thing, thing to think about with marine spatial planning is a lot of our legislative boundaries, for example, our territorial sea boundary and the EEZ, uh, these are um, not necessarily matching up with ecological scales, and a lot of activities actually cross these boundaries. So making sure when we're looking at economic development that we're looking at the development that goes across different boundaries. And so one of the things we had a lot of fun with in developing guidelines um, was in developing some potential case studies. So here's just one of our case study examples that we came up with, and how would we use marine spatial planning to allocate space for um, renewable energy? And so here we came up with an example of, here's in red, a proposed box where there might be offshore wind. And then if you're looking at all the different um, infographics in here, whether it's our marine mammals or fishing or deep sea corals or that sediment impact. After considering all of these different other potentially both complementary and or conflicting uses with offshore wind, then that boundary was moved after a participatory process. So for us, this was just one example of how marine spatial planning could be used to identify areas that balance conservation, monofenoa values, stakeholder values, but also supporting development of the blue economy. And a second example that we have uh, in the guidance documents was here one that was uh, looking at something that crossed infrastructure zones. So here is a cable protection zone. And so undersea cables often have a very limited area that are they're actually able to be protected, but how do we make sure that we're protecting cables from damage from anything that might be on the seafloor, but allow also the range of other activities that might be wanted to go on near where the cable protection zone is still allowing those to go forward. So in this case, we're looking at a cable protection zone, but then the process um, within this example that we created helps to get the social license for the cable protection zone as well as the willingness for communities to understand the types of gear restrictions that need to go on to protect that infrastructure from the cable protection zone but also still allow a lot of the um, activities that and values that the community wanted to continue uh, so I think that's just about all for me. Again, we have these two documents that we have online. So please do look at those for uh, further information. And just a quick thank you from me, from our team at NIWA, uh, Matt, Nitty, and Tom, and myself that helped to develop these guidance materials. And we also had about 25 um, amazing participants in workshops that we had that also helped with um, giving us input on the types of content that they would like to have in the document. So thank you, and back to you, Sophie. Kia ora. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Carolyn uh, about her presentation, please pop those in the Q&A box uh, that'll just be down the bottom of your screen. You can click on that to open it. Um, just while we wait, uh, 
What would you say the biggest barriers are to using MSP, Carolyn? Um, question already from you, Sophie. So, um, so I, I think for me, most of it is we actually do a lot of MSP already. So um, within whether it's our marine protected area design processes, um, a lot of work that's been going around implementing the Harkey Gulf. So a lot of things we do, um, the Fjordlands Marine Guardians, I would consider a marine spatial planning process, the Kaikoura process. So a lot of what we do brings in that multitude of different uses. But one of the key challenges is when we're bringing new activities in, we often don't have a special act of parliament that lets us bring all these activities in. Rather, we're looking at a single new activity that's applying for a consent. And so that's how we do a lot of things kind of retroactively, where rather than planning across a whole environment, coming up with what's appropriate in various spaces, we do things on a kind of one, one consent process whether it's the coastal or uh, uh, through RMA or um, more EEZ processes through the EPA. Great, thank you. I'll uh, just give it another minute to see if any other questions pop through. I've uh, just got one message that says really interesting. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, here we go. Um, from Catherine Chung, I'd like to hear more about cumulative effects and how they are assessed. Uh, from our experience, they have never been done properly in the EEZ in respect to the plight of endangered species, even without considering climate impacts. Uh, we will be having a webinar that will talk a little bit more about cumulative effects coming up, but do you have anything to add to that, Carolyn? Sure, and, and I think a lot um, more, I, I guess I'm assuming by EEZ scale, you're looking kind of from the territorial sea, so 12 nautical miles outward. Um, and so within that broader ecosystem, a lot of our challenge is the lack of information we have on a lot of animals um, that are listed as an, um, threatened under the uh, New Zealand threat classification. Uh, so a lot of these will be marine mammals, seabirds, but also deep sea corals that then are protected under the Wildlife Act. And so we're improving on the information we have on a lot of these animals. Um, and I know that's, you know, within our own work at NEWA, we're doing a lot of work looking at climate impacts and how climate might impact things from um, our cetaceans to dolphins. So again, trying to work through what the potential impacts are. And in the EZ, we're often looking at less kind of human impacts because it's much further offshore. So um, we may have fishing, we have potential for mining and offshore winds, but a lot of the major impacts um, are, you know, they're far less overlapping impacts, but understanding those impacts as well as the future climate impacts is important. Great, thank you. Uh, and if you do want to know more about cumulative effects and our research in that area, um, the next webinar on the 13th of June, we'll be touching on that. Um, we've got a few more questions here. So from Brianna, thanks for such a wonderful presentation. I love the perspective of not being stalled by waiting for perfect data. Do you think that a wider implementation of MSP will help speed up marine protection and reduce the barriers in these legislative processes? Uh, interesting question, particularly as we did have a spatial planning act that's gone away. So not to be too politically sensitive um, on anything, but I, I think marine spatial planning would certainly make things a lot easier. So having kind of that holistic decision making, and then you already know what is appropriate where. So in uh, most regional uh, coastal policy statements, there's often you know, distinctions on whether consents are, you know, appropriate somewhere, not appropriate, or need to actually apply for further review. Um, and marine spatial planning can actually help speed up exactly that process by identifying where things can occur, where they can't, where the significant natural areas are, where you have a lot of um, other uses that are or aren't appropriate in them. And by having that in one more holistic process, I think it certainly would speed things up and also speed things up for industry. So for economic development, by knowing what is and what isn't appropriate and might you know make the economic development process actually go a lot faster as well, because they'll know what places things can go. 
Great, thank you. And a bit of a related question before we move on to <laughs> Richard, I think. Uh, how will the fast track legislation affect MSP? You can't get out of the politics. Um, interesting. Um, I've, I've read a little bit with the fast track legislation. I mean, my understanding is it's not hopefully 100% bypassing the participatory process, but possibly is. So that's probably one of the key challenges is the lack of participation in there. And then the other one where the economic uh, value of a fast track proposal or the infrastructure value heavily outweighs any environmental bottom line that needs to be required. So I think those would be two major things in my my understanding of what's going on in select committee is those types of things are coming back as key things that do need to be considered in the fast track legislation. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, well, in the interest of time, we will keep moving on, but we will have some more time for questions at the end. Uh, so now I'm going to pass over to Richard, uh, who's going to be speaking with us about restoring marine ecosystems through better management and financing. Kia ora, uh, Ko Richard Bulmer Ho. So yes, so today I'm going to run through the Restorative Economy Synthesis Project. This was written up by myself, Georgina Flowers, who's here in the webinar today too, and Nick Lewis and Conrad Pildich, who are both in uh, Japan for other sustainable seas work at the moment. Um, it's also had a lot of input from other researchers, central and regional government representatives, as well as the science, the challenge science leadership team and the comms team. So this is a think piece project and it's developed over two workshops and informed by both challenge and non-challenge research. And the guidelines and summary documents can all be found on the Sustainable Seas website link. So I'd suggest please go there and take a look at all the other synthesis documents as well. So one of the key messages that was coming through from the workshop is that a healthy marine ecosystem can support a thriving sustainable blue economy and vice versa. But coastal marine ecosystems in Aotearoa are declining in health. And that's characterized by a loss of biodiversity and associated ecosystem services and functions. We really need to uh, put in place restorative management of the marine environment and it's needed urgently. To move forward, we need to improve how we manage marine ecosystems and how we fund restorative restoration activities. And this includes investment in developing legal policy and finance mechanisms to support restoration. We know that New Zealanders value the marine environment and the clean and green image, and that we have a deep cultural and ethical responsibility to sustain the environment for future generations. We know that coastal marine ecosystems provide a variety of ecosystem services, which New Zealanders rely on for their livelihoods and well-being, but they're under decline. And the decline is driven by multiple stresses rather than a single stressor from a single activity. And this means that the management of these marine systems is complex. And the complexity has led to managing single stresses from in individual activities in isolation. And, and because of this, there's been relatively little signs of ecological recovery. We urgently need to improve the management of cumulative effects. And marine management needs to shift from a focus on single focus on stressor management and slowing ecological decline to a dual focus on stress and management and the restoration activities and ecosystem recovery. So we need to shift towards more restoration and recovery if we want to improve ecosystem health. One of the key contributors um, to marine ecosystem decline is this disjointed management across ecosystem domains. So we're talking about the land, the freshwater and the sea. And that's summarized by this figure here. We have people on the land creating activities which generate multiple stresses or mess. And also you have people trying to manage that mess on land as well. But because water typically flows downhill, some of these stresses are exported to the freshwater system. And there additional activities and stresses are generated and additional management's occurring. And then even more stresses is, is uh, uh, um, washed downhill into the estuarine space in the coastal space. So ultimately more and more mess is transported downstream and this is a considerable um, 
cause of environmental degradation in the marine system. And as you can see in this figure, a lot of the actual um, management decisions that impact the marine space are decided based on decisions on the land and the fresh water. Not all though. So we need to ensure that the relationship between downstream issues and coastal ecosystems and upstream activities on land is acknowledged and appropriately managed. We also know that a thriving blue economy relies on a healthy marine ecosystem. And um, the figure on the left illustrates the reliance of the blue economy on, the healthy, on a healthy ecosystem and vice versa and the blue economy principles. So the blue economy means marine activities generate economic value and contribute positively to ecological, cultural, and social well-being, and support indigenous rights. We're not just talking about fisheries and ecotourism, but also, for example, employment to undertake restoration actions. The whole economy benefits from healthy marine ecosystems, yet the economic reliance on the marine environment is often poorly accounted for in decision making. Sustainable Seas Commission research suggests that the marine economy contributes over $7.4 billion per year to the economy. And this contribution relies on the ongoing health of our marine environments. Restoration activities are essential to a healthy ecosystem, which underpins a sustainable blue economy. An investment in restoration and recovery action is needed now and at multiple scales. Not just to improve the economy, but also to meet our legislative, cultural and ethical responsibilities and international agreement obligations. Around the globe, donors and governments have made major investments in marine, marine restoration. For example, in the Chesapeake Bay in the USA, last year, um, they spent over $2.2 billion on restorative action within their restorative program. Um, comparatively little funding in Aotearoa has um, occurred. So restorations instead are mainly at the smaller scale and led by iwi and hapu, community groups, government agencies or researchers at a project by project scale. Typically these restorative actions are focused on ecological recovery rather than funding sustainable livelihoods through restoration. But there are examples where there are clearer opportunities to fund sustainable livelihoods and where successful small scale restoration can be used as a springboard for upscaling. Some of these examples include uh, muscle bed restoration in the Horaki Gulf in Ohiwa Harbour, seagrass restoration in the Nelson estuaries, and salt marsh restoration in the Bay of, Bay of Plenty. The image on the right here is um, a collaborative project between Te Wahapu or Waihi, who are leading the work and the Bay of Plenty Regional Council. They um, purchased lowland farms adjacent to Little Waihi Estuary to restore salt marsh habitat with the aims to um, restore the health of the estuary. So along with partners, including the Nature Conservancy, um, where's my list here? The Nature Conservancy, Manaki Whenua, Cawthorn Institute, Paddle Dalimore Partners and Tidal Research, as well as NIWA for the modeling. Um, researchers are, are helping to collect some of the environmental data on the amount of carbon being sequestered by the restorative action and the hope that that can be used to um, further empower the scale and success of this restoration action. Small scale restoration provides a critical role in restoring marine ecosystems in Aotearoa. However, without upscaling restoration activity, we're, we are unlikely to reverse ecosystem decline. One emerging example of larger scale restoration um, in Aotearoa is Revive Our Gulf. This compares with, to a larger number of large scale projects on land. So we've got things like Predator Free 2050, One Billion Trees, Na'awa River Restoration. Implementation of restoration at scale requires the finance gap to be addressed. And because of the complexity around managing multiple cumulative stresses, and disjointed management systems in the marine space, restoration underwater is often more difficult than in on land. Potential funding mechanisms include nature-based disclosures and associated accounting, credit systems, targeted levies and subsidies. Examples of this include NUA's ocean conservation commitments to value invest in, in natural capital, the European Union's environmental taxes and subsidies, 
and the blue carbon method in Australia, which incentivizes landowners to restore blue carbon habitat. The ecological basis for restoration and the development of new economies to support or maintain efforts lags a long way behind terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems though. And looking at the relationship between the blue economy and restoration ecology together is needed to generate success. We know that ecosystem recovery at scale requires social, cultural and economic investment and to be driven by ecological knowledge or opportunity. Research on cumulative effects can inform uh, restoration actions and indicate opportunities where restoration is likely to be successful. So ecological and stressor principles can inform the current state of the system and the management action required for restoration. And the figure here focuses on uh, Kinnebarren management and how management action is conditional on the state of the ecosystem and the stresses present. Ecological disturbance recovery dynamics can assess likely recovery outcomes and ecosystem response footprints can inform the scale and benefit of the restoration action and whether stress and management accompanied by restoration actions are needed to improve ecosystem health. Ohewa Harbour Restoration Action provides a case study for how iwi-led restor restorative action supported by researchers, community, regional and central government can improve the health of the ecosystem via the restoration of important shellfish to the harbour. Restoration actions included using mātauranga Māori held by iwi and hapu members to identify historic muscle bed locations and to inform target areas for restorative action. Development of biodegradable natural spat lines using mātauranga held by master weavers to grow and restore mussels. Monitoring to understand mussel and starfish distributions. And then modeling using a combination of mātauranga Māori and science to identify the best areas to restore mussels and, and other shellfish within the harbour. Trials to work out the best methods for starfish control and the use of removed starfish and skincare collagen products. Another key opportunity to enhancing restorative actions is quantifying the benefits of restorative restoration action, which are typically poorly quantified and considered. The value of ecosystem services are typically uh, poorly quantified and considered. So this creates a major barrier in understanding the benefits, so both economic and non-economic of ecosystem services and the costs of their loss and attracting and securing investment. And this is compounded by limited knowledge of restorative costings or methodology options, making determining the best investment for restorative action challenging. So the figure here shows some examples of these benefits. Uh, for uh, mussel reefs, and this could improve, improve uh, include improvement to kaimoana, um, creation of habitats for marine life, enhanced nutrient cycling, climate regulation, and improved cultural and amenity values. Communicating the flow and effects of restoration projects is a key to increasing support for restoration activities. However, these benefits are also often poorly quantified. We know that ecosystems are highly connected. An impact in one location can have cascading impacts in many other areas. These can be both positive and negative. Um, the, the images here on the slide demonstrate some of these concepts for shellfish restoration on the, on the left and uh, salt marsh restoration on the right, where your restorative action results in an ecosystem improvement outside of the restoration, restorative action location. Improved attribution of wider ecosystem benefits for restoration actions is a key opportunity for increasing the financial and non-financial support for restoration activities. Research on quantifying ecosystem services can help measure and inform restoration success. So some relevant sustainable seas research includes linking the spatial distributions of shellfish with multiple ecosystem services. And that's summarized in the figure here. Other examples include identifying the relationships between species, ecosystem processes, and ecosystem services, and modeling these relationships using tools such as Bayesian networks to run management scenarios of interest, and investigating the ecosystem service potential of marine protected areas. So 
Um, based on uh, the two workshops that we've had and the Sustainable Seas research um, and other research that we've been able to compile, um, we've we've pulled together a list of recommendations, which we split into short-term and long-term recommendations. They're not a recipe for how you achieve them. That needs to happen um, next. Instead, they identify these high-level opportunities for enhancing restorative outcomes in Aotearoa. So in the short term, uh, the recommendations are to enhance the ongoing collaborative action and cross-organizational leadership to determine what restorative restorative or recovery actions are needed where and by who, how to best achieve these actions to result in ecosystem recovery, how to measure the effect effectiveness of the restorative action. And key here is to shift our management focus from solely managing stresses to more widely managing ecological responses to support recovery. And this might be achieved, for instance, by incorporating managed recovery as an objective within coastal plans. To increase the size and the number of marine protected areas in the network, so via Mataito reserves, for instance, and consider these areas in the context of ecological connectivity and enhancing the blue economy. To invest in marine restoration research and new ways of valuing all the benefits provided by marine, healthy marine ecosystems. To strengthen the social and management feedback so that the relationship between downstream issues and coastal ecosystems and upstream activities on land is acknowledged and appropriately managed. And to add details of recovery act activities to a shared portal, for example, the Department of Conservation's estuaries hubs. To use adaptive processes to support action now and use research to mitigate risks and inform successful restoration and recovery action, i.e. we can't keep waiting for the perfect science and management and legal frameworks to do something. To use case studies co-developed with iwi, hapu, community, government and investors as a proof of concept to inform future restorative action and attract further investment and to expand research and prototyping of new revenue and business models for restorative marine economies, including investment in ecosystem level solutions. In the long term, the recommendation was made to set long term priorities and management actions that transcend political cycles. This might be through identifying universal political priorities, for example, quantifying the benefits provided by marine ecosystems in order to meet international obligations and responsibilities to develop the legal policy and market mechanisms to support enduring restorative action. This might be through nature markets and payments for ecosystem services, credit systems, targeted levies and subsidies to better align the costs of environmental degradation and the benefits of recovery. Establish restoration and recovery as a mainstream asset class and provide clarity and accountability around the roles and responsibilities of central and regional government researchers, business, iwi and hapu, and build greater collaboration between all parties. So that's a summary of the restorative economy synthesis work. Thank you so much for listening to the presentation. Um, just to acknowledge that it was uh, developed by many people and we thank everyone who's contributed to this project. Kia ora. Richard, thank you for that. Uh, so we do have some time now for more questions. Uh, and Carolyn, if you're still available to answer, we've had one more come through for you. Uh, so our, our question is around what is being considered for near shore and on land terrestrial issues, uh, i.e. roads. Um, with upcoming climate change issues, there will be quite a bit of modification needed to these areas. Uh, and that link with the environmental effects needs to be considered. Is this considered within MSP work? Uh, yeah, thanks, Sophie. So uh, certainly in the way that we present marine spatial planning, where it's incorporating those land-based impacts or land-based stressors on marine ecosystems, it should be. Um, my understanding of a lot of things like road developments or urban developments, that many of those do have to consider their impacts on the nearshore and coastal environments, particularly through uh, sediment erosion that's caused by them. Uh, but again, typically we do think 
these in a single consent process rather than looking more holistically. And you can see kind of obvious challenges of doing single consents um, when Cyclone Gabrielle, as well as the um, King's birthday floods in Auckland. When we think about things just kind of one off, it's the death by a thousand cuts, and we really do need to be thinking holistically. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, we've got a question for you, Richard. Uh, do you see opportunities or roles of a biodiversity credit scheme in financing restoration, and how might it work? Uh, the short answer is yes. So um, we've been doing more a lot of work in the blue carbon space, and what we've observed in that area is that um, blue carbon alone is unlikely to um, economically offset the cost of a restorative action. However, um, in Australia, for instance, they're looking at how they might bundle a blue carbon, carbon scheme with biodiversity credits to get the value of that credit up, and that seems to be quite successful. It also is useful because it um, creates a, a bit of context for a blue carbon scheme so that you ensure that you're more likely to be enhancing the biodiversity at the same time as enhancing the blue carbon opportunity. So that's a win-win as well. Great, thank you, Richard. Uh, we'll wait a couple more minutes to see if we have some more questions coming through for you. Um, but I did have a question myself. You mentioned the importance of understanding ecosystem services and having information on those. Uh, how much more research is needed in that area? What's it looking like at the moment? Uh, so there's a growing body of work in that um, in that space, and we've cited quite a lot of that literature in the, um, in the synthesis documents as well. So um, that's really great to see. I think that there's still a fair bit of opportunity to um, better communicate that information and also um, look at, we talked about how the benefit of a restorative action can be offset from the actual location of where that restoration is, for instance. Um, and how you would use this information potentially in a credit scheme or just to enhance general um, restorative actions outside of a credit scheme as well. So I think there's lots of research opportunity in that space. 